over on Jaguar Eater 7, a new baseball video is out. In this video, we talk about a bizarre controversy in 1984 between the Detroit Tigers and musician John Denver. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you an insane hypothetical scenario. Suppose on Thursday at the NFL Draft, a team turns in their draft card and decides to select this player right here. USC quarterback Caleb Williams. Obviously, Williams is a great player. I think a ton of teams would kill to have him on their team. There's just one small problem. Williams isn't eligible to be chosen in this draft. He doesn't come out until 2024, so you're not allowed to draft him this year. Commissioner Roger Goodell reads the card, announces the pick, and then, a few minutes later, says, wait a second, time out. You can't do that. Redo your pick. Something like that would seem kind of ridiculous on so many levels, wouldn't it? Well, that's kind of what happened with this team right here, the New York Jets. In 1968, they were on top of the football world, and for good reason. Not only did they have the biggest superstar maybe in all of American sports in Joe Namath, and not only did they make it to the Super Bowl, but they stunned the Baltimore Colts at Super Bowl III, becoming the first AFL team to ever win a Super Bowl and giving legitimacy to a league widely regarded as inferior. It seemed like absolutely nothing could bring the Jets down after that win. Yeah, it took two weeks for the Jets to do something stupid. A mere two weeks after winning the Super Bowl, the Jets were a laughingstock by those in attendance for what they did during the 1969 NFL-AFL Draft. Because this is the story behind what might just be Considering the absolutely bizarre circumstances behind it, the craziest draft pick in the over 60-year history of the New York Jets franchise. Before I talk about what exactly made this pick absurd, we need some context to understand the player in question that the Jets wanted to draft in the first place, which is this man right here, who you're going to be watching highlights of in the NFL, Vic Washington. Oddly enough, this is not the first time I've done a video on Vic Washington. As a while ago, I talked about the rather bizarre end to his time with the San Francisco 49ers. So you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. After spending time with the University of Wyoming, Washington dropped out and joined the Canadian Football League, playing up north with the Ottawa Rough Riders. And with Ottawa, Washington made an immediate impact, as during the 1968 season, he was named the first team all CFL player and was named an all-star in the East. He was a big reason why the Rough Riders ended up winning the Grey Cup that season, as Ottawa ended the season with a top offense in the league, thanks in part to the one-two punch at running back of Bo Scott and Vic Washington. Washington ended the season with 678 rushing yards on 6.2 yards per carry and a team leading seven rushing touchdowns with Washington ending 7th in the CFL in rushing yards and tied for 3rd in rushing touchdowns. It was clear that Washington was an awfully good player, and the decision to leave Wyoming, where he wasn't getting a whole lot of touches, to play up north, turned out to be the right one, as it was there where he truly put himself on the football world map. Now the bad news for the Jets was that Washington's rights were still held by the CFL for another two years. The earliest that he could possibly join the NFL was in 1971. However, the Jets knew this in advance. It's not like the situation I talked about yesterday with the Cincinnati Bengals drafting a guy and being completely oblivious to the fact that his rights were in another league, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The Jets didn't necessarily need Washington right now. Then again, they didn't necessarily need a whole lot right now seeing as they just won the Super Bowl and were the best team in football. But this was some long-term thinking on the part of the Jets. There's no one in the 17th round with pick number 442 that can possibly help us right now. This is the last pick of the draft. We're not trading this pick. In the 17th round the previous year in 1968, of the 27 picks in that round, only six of them even made it to the NFL, or 22% and none of the final 13 picks, including our choice, running back Miles Strasser, made it. We don't need a running back right now, 
but by the time Washington is allowed to join the NFL in 1971, we absolutely might, especially since running back is a fickle position. And of the four leading rushers on the Jets in 1968, while Emerson Boozer would still be in his prime, Matt Snell would be approaching 30, Billy Joe would be 30, and Bill Mathis would be 32, and might be done. Essentially, we're drafting a guy that has shown that he can be starting, or at the very least, a rotational running back in the NFL if his CFL stint is anything to go off of, and we're hedging our bets for the future, so that even as our running backs age and get up there, when 1971 hits, we don't really need a running back. All in all, this seemed to be an incredibly smart strategy by the Jets and Weeb Uvay, and it was perfectly legal. Teams drafted players in the CFL knowing that the rights would eventually expire, and that they would be able to get them to play in the NFL afterwards. Teams drafted players at military schools for the same reason, knowing that they can't play right away, and that eventually, their service time would be finished, and they could play in the NFL. Heck, the Dallas Cowboys drafted quarterback Roger Staubach in the 10th round in 1964, and he didn't step foot in the NFL until 1969, and I think that worked out pretty well for them. So with the final pick in the 1969 NFL AFL draft, the New York Jets selected the Wyoming running back, Vic Washington. He was going to be pick number 442, and that was the last name in the entire draft, thus concluding the marathon process. And as you've been watching from these highlights of Washington the whole time, the Jets knew what they were doing. They had the right idea when it came to hedging their bets and drafting for the future with this guy. Because only three other players from that 17th round even made it into the NFL or the AFL, with two of them being Chargers defensive back Larry Rents and Browns defensive end Bob Oliver, who were out of the league by 1969, and the other being Oilers center Hank Autry, who was out of the league by 1970. They knew that no one left on the board who was eligible would do anything, but Washington, even if they had to wait a bit, might become something, because he single-handedly outperformed every player in the 17th round combined. When he was finally allowed to come into the NFL in 1971, he led the NFL in all-purpose yards, recording 1,986 of them, and finishing inside the top 10 of the league with 811 rushing yards. Not only was Washington named the Pro Bowler in his very first season of the league, but he was one of just four players to receive a vote for AP Offensive Rookie of the Year, alongside John Riggins, Jim Plunkett, and the eventual winner, John Brockington. That's pretty good company to be in. He found the end zone 21 times over his career, and when you combine his contributions as a return man and as a running back, he had just under 6,700 all-purpose yards, finishing fourth in that category as well during the 1972 season, and finishing 7th in yards from scrimmage in 1971. When you're in the 17th round and picking in the mid-400s, all you're looking for at that point is any living body who can make a roster. If he turns out to be an award recipient and one of the better players in football, you hit the jackpot, and the Jets absolutely did that here. However, you might have noticed something throughout all of these highlights and clips of Washington. And that is the unavoidable fact that not one of them took place with Washington in a Jets uniform. So why was that the case? Did the Jets make a trade and put the rights to Washington in there? Did they release Washington before he ever played a game for them? Did Washington outright refuse to play for the Jets or something like that? None of those things. Turns out, after the Jets made the final pick of the draft, and everyone was packing up and getting ready to go home, Commissioner Pete Rozell came to the podium and said, Wait a second, everyone. Hey, New York, you're not allowed to do this. Washington was not eligible to be drafted. The Jets made an illegal pick. Remember what I said earlier about how Washington dropped out of college to play in the CFL? Well, if you're a college dropout, you have to wait an additional year before you can get drafted to go into the NFL or the AFL. This is to incentivize players to finish school and not play for other leagues. 
So if Washington stayed at Wyoming for his four-year career, then yes, Washington would be eligible for the 1969 draft. However, because he was a dropout, even though his class would have been graduating in 1969, he wouldn't be eligible until 1970. In other words, the Jets drafted an illegal player. They drafted a guy that they were not allowed to draft. The Jets thought they were in the clear, seeing as everyone was packing up and ready to go home, but they were not. After some heated discussions between the Jets and league officials, the league officials ordered the Jets to make another pick, or forfeit their selection entirely. If they wanted Washington that badly, they could try again in 1970. There was nothing stopping them from doing that. But as for the 1969 draft, this would have been an illegal pick. Try again. And this meant that the Jets drafted not one Mr. Irrelevant, but rather two Mr. Irrelevants, before that even became a thing. With their new pick number 442, the Jets, essentially having to make a panic pick, seeing as they didn't plan on drafting another player, and seeing as everyone just wanted to go home by this point, ended up choosing this man right here, Duke defensive tackle Fred Zirkel. And the Jets really did their homework on Zirkel, seeing as Zirkel said that the Jets never even called him once during the process, and seeing as even though he was honored to be drafted, he decided to forego a professional football career. As Zirkel said, I didn't know whether I'd be drafted or not because I wasn't a sure signo. I'm very interested in going into business because I'm real eager to accomplish the most that I can. Turns out, Zirkel was going to go to graduate school, attending the University of Pennsylvania at the Warden School of Finance, but changed his mind to manage the local branch in Charlotte of AGS Services, which, seeing all the success he's had in the business world since, I think was the right move. Zirkel wasn't even considering the NFL, saying, I was rather surprised that I was even drafted. Everyone I thought was interested in me, I had contacted and told them I didn't want to play. I just felt like I wanted to hurry up and establish myself in business. Another thing, I've had three knee operations. I have no cartilage in my left knee, but mostly, I was real anxious to go to work. So good job, Jets. You drafted an illegal player, and then you panicked and drafted a player who was never even going to play professional football and put out a plea to other teams saying, please don't draft me, I'm not going to play, I'm injured, I'm done with football. The Jets thought they were planning for their future with their 17th round pick, and in the end, they just threw that pick right out the window. Oh, and Washington, when he actually became eligible in 1970, as you might have been able to guess, was chosen in the fourth round by the San Francisco 49ers. So what's the moral of the story here? When you're drafting a player, make sure that the player in question is, you know, eligible to be drafted. The last thing you want to do is to draft a player and then find out that you weren't allowed to draft it in the first place and you have to redo your pick. Because if you do that, as the New York Jets found out the hard way in 1969, you're going to look really, really stupid. To start off the calendar year of 1969, the Jets were on top of the football world and seemed like they could do absolutely nothing wrong. That was everything except for making an eligible draft pick. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.